this one's a little bit spontaneous. Um, now, first things first, I've just literally just finished a live stream, but I've got more space on the computer at the moment, so I'll take advantage of this when I've got it. Thank you to everyone who turned up to the live stream. I appreciate it, as always. And I will do those periodically, so if you missed it, no worries. When I don't respond to comments below, uh, a live stream is always a good opportunity to raise those questions again. Okay, so um, this video I want to talk about history. Um, I love history. I find it fascinating. Um, I have a pretty good memory with history. You know, you could give me any year of the 20th century and I could probably cite some of the events of that year, not to blow my own trumpet, but just to emphasize that I have a big, big interest in this. My father is also interested in history, but he tends to be more focused on the Victorian period and the world wars. With myself, I can... I can be just as interested in antiquity as um, a more contemporary event, although the approach to the different parts of history will be different depending on the resources available. But what I want to talk about is how we approach history in a democracy. This has been a very hot topic in recent years with a lot of the protests against statues and the culture wars. And I thought I would just share... Some of my thoughts as to how I see this. Uh, we've also had calls for reparations regarding the transatlantic slave trade. Um, that maybe would require a more specific video. I'm not totally on board with it because the problem is if you agree to pay reparations, where do you draw a red line? For example, you'd have to say, well, can you prove that you were personally um, affected by the transatlantic slave trade? And at this point, You'd be going back goodness knows how many generations. I mean, the United Kingdom abolished the slave trade in 1807, and it was abolished across the British Empire in 1833. So we're talking now almost 200 years ago. So what is that, eight generations? I know, for example, the state of California has proposed paying out to African Americans who can claim that they have a lineage from slaves. Um, I think that's absurd. It's just basically, I mean, if you want to go down that line, if you were to take that in its purest form, you know, generation after generation, the north of England suffered something called the harrying of the north during the Norman conquest, and some regard it as a genocide, uh, at least 100,000 dead, many from famine, many killed. It was very, very brutal, and it caused an imbalance for generations to come. Now, could you, in theory, argue that a modern Northumbrian could reclaim from London, you know, because of what William the Conqueror's force has done? I mean, that would be ridiculous. Um, that's a problem with historic arguments for reparations. Like, at what point is the cutoff point? Now, if you have a situation where there's been an injustice and it's within living memory, I'm actually sympathetic to the party pushing for justice. As an example, um, there are Kenyans who have sought some sort of settlement with the British government over alleged torture uh, during the Mau Mau uprising in the 1950s. There's not many of them left. They're very elderly people now. I know the king recently met a Kenyan World War II veteran, and the sad thing was that man had served king and country, uh, the current king's grandfather, of course, but he couldn't get his medal because he would have been seen as a collaborator with the British. Now, often these things are not black and white. With the Mau Mau, there was attacks on civilians, both white civilians and on local Kenyans. So they were effectively a terrorist movement. But then again, um, I don't agree with those conservatives who have this knee-jerk reaction when it comes to claims made against the British army. It has to be said, there are times British soldiers have done things that cannot be defended. And, you know, it's difficult to say that because conservatives especially get this knee-jerk reaction. Oh, you're criticising our brave men and women in uniform. You're anti-military. You're unpatriotic. Well, I come from Northern Ireland. There were things, frankly, done during the Troubles that do not present our armed forces in the best light. And it's also true that they were victims of terrorism. And, you know, you had young soldiers going over to Derry or Belfast in the early 70s 
in a very, very difficult position. You know, they were hated. They were getting things thrown at them. Their lives were in danger all the time. It was a very, very difficult environment to be in. But you look at something like Bloody Sunday, I mean, the thing is, there were atrocities committed by Irish Republicans that were on a bigger scale than that and not as well remembered. But unfortunately, that was the image that stuck. British soldiers gunned down Irish civilians. Um, Amritsar, you know, uh, we can point to many, many things that the British done. I was going to say British Empire, but even after the Empire, that are less than honourable. Um, but the point I would make is you can't single any empire out, really, because all the European powers have blood on their hands. But then I would argue every power has had blood on its hands in history. Um, look at what Imperial Japan done during the war. Um, and as for the Islamic conquests, we're talking millions killed. Same with the Mongol conquests. What I will say is there seems to be a unique stigmatization of western countries regarding imperialism i mean granted japan's had a lot of critique as well i've been in chinese markets where they depict the japanese as devils to this day um japan's record has been somewhat mixed on one hand they've made official state apologies and they've changed the constitution um and it's become a much better democracy than it was during the imperialistic militaristic era so Japan's come a long way, but they've also had politicians visiting the Yasukuni Shrine, which includes war criminals, convicted war criminals. And there are some Japanese in denial of what Imperial Japan done. Then again, Chinese communists are hardly in a position to talk about denying history. Now, I've lived and worked in China. It's a country that will totally ignore the dark parts of its past if that those dark parts are highlighting what the communists have done the millions, millions dead under Chairman Mao. But if it comes to the Japanese or, you know, the British or the French regarding the Opium Wars, then they'll highlight that for sure. Um, maybe this is the nature of nationalism. Um, and I think it's easier for any nation state to highlight what enemies have done more than to look in the mirror and say, yes, we also have guilt. Um I think one of the hallmarks of a great nation is to be honest about its past. So I do take the view that Western democracies need to also be honest about the past. I would argue there is a lot more transparency than you would get in totalitarian states. I mean, I would argue you could go in any British library and look up the slave trade. We've got films about it. We've got uh, documentaries about it, books about it. it no one can say this has been ignored. Um, and it's got a lot more coverage, incidentally, than another slave trade, which was the Barbary slave trade. Now, the Barbary slave trade involved North African Barbary pirates who literally kidnapped white Europeans, Portuguese, English, Irish, in coastal communities spanning roughly the late 17th century, right up until the Barbary Wars of the 1800s. I have a, a print of a painting which actually shows a British-Spanish coalition taking on Barbary pirates in an event called the Bombardment of Algiers in, I believe it was 1804. Um, that's forgotten. Most people don't know anything about that. Now, I appreciate the transatlantic slave trade was on a particularly large scale, and it wasn't just the slave trade, it was generations of, of slavery in the United States. I mean, I would always say that has to be acknowledged, and, you know, Decades of Jim Crow discrimination and brutality has to be acknowledged. But I often wonder, when you're looking at history, what is the purpose? Is it about truth? Is it about justice? Is it about spreading knowledge? Or is it about vindictiveness? I do wonder if some of the movements in recent years, are they really about spreading knowledge about the past or are they about getting even? And I would say that whilst the right may be guilty of downplaying some of these things, I do think the left has often pushed an anti-West narrative. I mean, they will vilify the British Empire, but they'll ignore the fact, for example, that in India, the British got rid of the practice of, I believe it was called sati, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, whereby a Hindu bride had to be burned along with her husband in a funeral pyre. The British got rid of that. 
Now, um, I don't think anyone who believes in human rights would say getting rid of that was a bad thing. Um, and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the British, with around 100,000 administrators, controlled India with, at that point, two, three hundred million 300 million people for centuries. Now, you cannot control uh, an area, you cannot control a region, a nation, although actually India's nationhood is questionable because before the British it wasn't one unified polity, it was a collection of princely states. But, you know, I'm uh, maybe that people could say that's nitpicking, but it is important when people talk about the first Indian War of Independence. Anyway, I digress. Um, you cannot have that situation without having some um, endorsement of the ruling power. I mean, why is it that when the British East India Company moved in, there wasn't a mass uprising by the Indians against it and, you know, we weren't kicked out immediately? In terms of manpower, there was far, far more Indians than there were colonial administrators. And, I, you know, people say oh, it's a divide and rule policy of empires, but that it's kind of my point. No empire exists by being despised the whole time. All empires are fundamentally selfish. All empires are fundamentally exploitative, but they cannot survive without some give and take, um, to put it rather crudely. I'm reading a book uh, by Neil Ferguson called Empire. It's a very good read. I don't agree with all of Ferguson's positions, but um, in this particular book, I think it's very balanced. It's about the British Empire and the history of the British Empire. But there is a fundamental human component when we're looking at history. And that is that if you look around the world, in countries that sort of gained their independence from a colonial power, India, Indonesia, you know, most African and Asian countries, um, nationalism is not taboo. It's normal. It's to be applauded. Yet when we see patriotism in European countries, it's shunned. It's kind of associated with the far right. Now, what I would argue is we need to reclaim it from the far right and the far left because both the far right and the far left weaponize it. So the far right will talk about blood and soil nationalism. They don't necessarily promote the empire, but they'll talk about blood and soil nationalism. Um, the far left weaponize imperialism in the sense that they, they they would want a situation where textbooks just say the evil British moved in and killed everyone and we exploited people and it was evil and it was terrible and it was wrong. Now, what I argue is by all means, you need to include the exploitation. You need to include the atrocities and the harshness of imperial rule. But you need to have a balanced approach to this. You need to talk about how the British also built railways in India hospitals the Westminster system of government. Um, this isn't propaganda, it's just the reality. Um, I think there has to be balance. Now, the far left would simply want a situation where our history is vilified, where statues are torn down. We have one in Sunderland, actually. It's about 10 minutes from where I live. It's one Sir General, uh, Sir Henry Havelock. He was a general, and he was involved in the mutiny of 1857. He was killed, I believe, at Lucknow. And he's sort of a local hero. Now, that's exactly the sort of statue that would be targeted during the the whole culture wars protest. The one in Bristol, um, what I would argue about that is, OK, those people railing against the transatlantic slave trade, and they argue that Colston greatly benefited from it. My point would be, well, what about slavery today? If you really want to tackle the legacy of slavery, would it not be better to focus on slavery today? And the inconvenient truth is some of the worst offenders are African states. Another point about the transatlantic slave trade that always gets left out is African complicity. But if you say that to a black uh, campaigner for slavery reparations, they would get offended and they'd say, how dare you talk about that? You know, you're trying to, they just wouldn't want to hear it. But it is a component of this. So my point would be, yes, let's talk about the exploitation. Let's talk about how evil it was. It was. But, and, you know, cities like Bristol and Liverpool became wealthy from it. But let's look at the whole picture. Um, I'm, I'm talking about one big subject here, but 
we could talk about anything. Um, what, what I would say about history is there has to be a balancing act. You have to be honest and it cannot just be sanitized and glossed over to be overtly patriotic. But I also think that patriotism needn't mean um, censorship. It needn't mean um, just this blind praise. I think the left is guilty of wanting to vilify our history and wanting to present our history as all terrible and all based on greed and exploitation. And they'll gloss over the many Great Britons who have shaped history for the better. You know, I think there is a danger of vilifying past generations and implying that they were just bad people and that somehow progressives are always better. I mean, we look at the world today. Is it so much better? We still have war. We have thing, We have problems that didn't exist in the past. I mean, internet crime didn't exist in the past. And I don't want to digress too much, but my attitude to history, basically, I am patriotic. I do love my country, and I make no apology for that. But that doesn't mean that I, I pretend that we haven't had problems. It doesn't mean that I pretend that the British haven't in history done some pretty bad things, because we have. What I take issue with is those who will choose to live in this country, uh, whether they be British themselves or whether they be people who have moved in, and they spend all their time attacking it. Now, my question would be, what's the real agenda? You know, is it vindictiveness or is it justice? If they want to argue it's justice, then fine, talk about history. But if you're talking about reparations, you need to clearly define where does that end? Because if you, for example, were to argue along the reparations route, and incidentally, when slavery was abolished, there was a massive chunk of the national economy taken out. I don't know what precise figures were, but it didn't come without a price. And there was an intense, intense negotiations. One reason there was such hostility to it is because the slave traders were big, you know, investors in the stock exchange. People like William Wilberforce and um, Eladu Equiano, or, uh, you know, those people, Granville Sharp, they knew what they were up against. They knew that the big argument would be abolishing the slave trade would damage the national economy. And in the end, when it was abolished, there was a lot of money taken out to, to deal with this. Because remember, when, when you change a fundamental part of the economy, it causes a lot of, um, you know, you don't need to be an economist to see that disruption. So, but it was the right thing to do because it was an evil trade in human beings. Um, so my attitude to history is I get suspicious of the regressive left. I, you know, I call them regressive left is if they're constantly focusing on the negative, if they're constantly wanting to vilify our history whilst turning a blind eye to other parts of the world. I mean, what I find suspicious is far leftists who will talk about the evils of the British Empire. But they'll ignore, for example, what African dictators have done to their own people in the post-independence era, um, what the Iranian regime has done since the Islamic Revolution, what Russia under Putin has been doing for the past 20 years, if not imperialism. So if they're consistent on these matters, fair enough. But the thing is, they're often not consistent. I've seen far leftists who will vilify this country, but turn a blind eye to wrongs done by any state that isn't anti-West, excuse me, that is anti-West. It's what I would say is this unique focus on Western countries. Why is it the Europeans are uniquely expected to feel shame about our history, yet you wouldn't put that on Indians or Chinese, despite some of the things that have gone on in their history? You know, uh, this sense of shame is uniquely put on Europeans. And I have a problem with it. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll round this up. I I feel I have a pretty good grasp of history. And history is rarely black and white. History is full of nuances. History is full of um, context that cannot easily be dismissed one way or another. Um, it's not that often that there's clear villains and clear heroes. Sometimes there is. But... The point about history is we have to be honest about it, but I think it's a big mistake to teach young British students that our history is all terrible and, you know, the British Empire was evil and 
you know, the most toxic thing of all is critical race theory. I think that helps no one. Because what does it do? It teaches white children that they're perpetual racists, and it teaches minority children that they're perpetual victims. Now, who does that help? It's a toxic ideology. Um, I do think some conservatives are in denial about the darker aspects of her past, and that's wrong. Um, they will dismiss things. For example, I've seen them talk about Angor Tamor, the Irish famine, in very dismissive ways. Well, no, it was a terrible event. It was on a large scale and absolutely fueled Irish nationalism. But um, the point about history is there has to be a balance. And when it comes to something like patriotism, when you're telling people you're not allowed to be patriotic, oh, but it's fine if, you know, people in African countries and Asian countries are patriotic, but you as a European must feel shame. No. Now, if, I mean, if you have certain situations, say you have a German being in denial about the Third Reich, um, or an Italian about Mussolini's extremes, or a Briton about the excesses of the British Empire, then yeah, that's wrong. But fundamentally telling people they should be ashamed of their country is wrong. And I think there are some on the left who want to do just that. They want to change our curriculum so that it's drenched in shame and self-flagellation. No. I think that is the wrong approach. Let's be honest about our past. But let's be balanced. That's all. I think that's a very reasonable proposition because it doesn't gloss over the negative stuff, but nor does it vilify our past. So that's my take on history and how history should be approached.